problems in infants uh, globally. Uh, second set of numbers is antiviral treatment is available globally um, for infected persons. And for children, about 52% have access to antiviral drugs. For pregnant women, up to 80% have access to ARVs to prevent mother-to-child transmission. So nowhere near 90% in terms of access to treatment and access to prevention efforts. So I just want to bring us back to the epidemic in the U.S. Um, to remind you, this is a, a paper that's impressed, which is why the D is in, in gray. It's still um, accepted and in, um, in press, so not fully published. But to remind you, in the United States, we still have ongoing perinatal infections with 53 in, reported in 2015. So this estimated transmission rate is about 1.1%. We should really be at near zero in terms of transmission amongst uh, infants in this country. This, however, is a dramatic decrease in transmission, in, mother, in perinatal transmission from 1991, where this is a 97% decrease. Um, in the US, though, what this points out, there are racial disparities and missed opportunities um, in the setting of perinatal transmission. And so what are the missed opportunities? This is a report from the Centers for Disease Control. I just want to leave you with these numbers. So 14 to 70 percent of the infections in infants in this country are made during pregnancy. The diagnosis in, in the mothers are made during pregnancy. 30 percent, the women are diagnosed after delivery. And so, and 7 to 18 percent of these new infections are occurring to women who acquired HIV infection during pregnancy, so acute infection in pregnancy. And then when you look at postpartum suppression rates, 37 to 39% of postpartum women retained in care. So we actually have a large proportion who are lost to follow-up, and our viral suppression rates are 30 to 61%. So I think what I, the, the point of this, the numbers are small, they're 53 compared to 180,000 globally, but with new efforts on, um, elimination of HIV within the U.S., we need to still pay attention to perinatal infections and efforts to increase identification of infection during pregnancy. So I'm par um, Carl gave the primer in terms of the barriers to HIV cure with the formation of the latent HIV reservoir in virtually all infected persons. And so the next two slides, I'm just going to summarize the similarities and differences between reservoirs in perinatal infections. As in adults, the latent reservoir prevents art-free remission and cure. It's formed very early in infection. And the best um, case to illustrate how early this reservoir is formed is the case of the Mississippi baby who we described in 2013. I'll quickly go over that case. It is the first case of art-free remission in HIV infection. So while Mr. Timothy Brown set the stage in terms of HIV remission and cure, the Mississippi baby was the first demonstration that treating very early in, in an adult or an infant could lead to remission. There, there are, however, very distinct features of the latent reservoir and perinatal infection, and that has to do with early treatment of infection. So I want to distinguish between very early treatment and early treatment. Early treatment is roughly around two to three months of life. So around, because that's how long it takes to identify an infant as being infected with the current testing algorithm. Whereas very early treatment, what we're talking about is treatment within 48 hours of birth, or for those born uh, infected perinatally around the time of birth, hopefully within the first week of life. But what we know is the reservoir actually in these children surviving to adolescence because we now have 20 years of experience of infants born in the US, in Europe, in Thailand, other countries, in, even in South Africa now, with up to 10 years, receiving continuous antiretroviral treatment, starting at two to three months of life, and surviving into adolescence. And when you test those HIV-infected adolescents who are infected as neonates, it's very hard to detect HIV-infected cells in the circulation. If you can sequence the virus, it's very similar to what was transmitted when there were newborns. But when you look for HIV-specific immune responses, these are nearly absent. In other words, if you look for a standard HIV antibody test, most of these adolescents will test negative 
with standard testing. But this doesn't mean they've been cured. It means they've actually had good control of HIV replication and have been able to maintain small reservoirs because we know from all um, of our experience in the field, when these children go off treatment, even though they're antibody negative and DNA negative, the virus comes right back within two to four weeks, as Carl illustrated on that slide. But I want to ask, are there any parents or guardians of infected children in the audience? No. Okay, so, well, I think it's important for you guys to still know that there are a population of um, infected kids out there that we need to establish cure strategies for. And so th this slide shows really what the overarching goal of a HIV remission and cure strategies. And it's to move us from the current present of time of lifelong antiretroviral treatment, daily antiretroviral treatment for continuous virologic suppression, to a time in the future where patients can actually have periods where they can go off antiretroviral treatment for some period of time. And the, that period of time really needs to be defined in terms of the risk benefit ratio of going on and off antiretroviral treatment. But what you see on the far right is um, Mr. Timothy Brown's case, and as you heard, is now 12 years off antiretroviral treatment, described in 2019, that really set the stage for HIV care providers and researchers to start thinking about case identification around HIV cure and remission. And it was in that mindset and development of the HIV cure agenda that we started to develop a definition for what HIV remission and cure would look like in the pediatric setting. And that's why we stumbled upon the case of the Mississippi baby described in 2013. So I do want to go through this case to highlight a couple of points. And if you start on the far left of this line plot you see at birth, first you have to, have to confirm that this infant was indeed infected. And what's standard for the field, for any HIV-exposed infant, is testing of blood. And here you have to do nucleic acid testing to see if you can detect HIV DNA or RNA in, in the circulation. And two tests are required because we know when you start infants on antiretroviral drugs, it's a lifelong endeavor. If you treat early, it actually becomes difficult to detect HIV-infected cells, and therefore it's hard to know whether it's a case that was really misdiagnosed or not. And so the standard for the field is two separate blood tests um, for HIV DNA and RNA. So in this child, we had a clear indication that she was infected. Starts a preventative regimen, this was a mother who was diagnosed during labor and delivery, so had no antiretroviral drugs on board, and her pediatrician, Dr. Hanagay, decided to give her a three-drug antiretroviral prophylactic regimen for prevention of transmission. That regimen was AZT, 3TC, and nevirapine. Those are really the only drugs we have available for prevention and treatment in that age group. In fact, before the Mississippi baby, the donverapine dose that was um, known at the time was really for prevention. We did not have the pharmacokinetic data for how to even dose nevirapine for treatment of HIV infection in a neonate. So this case kind of spurred not only a, an agenda towards HIV remission and cure, but really to be able to expand the armamentarium of antiretroviral drugs for HIV-infected infants. And then continues this regimen for 18 months, was lost to follow up for five months and represents at 23 months of age, at which time the same blood tests that were used to diagnose infection at birth were repeated off antiretroviral drugs and no HIV was detected. HIV antibody was negative, And that's why we decided to continue to follow this infant because in our experience, any infant who's infected rebounds within two and goes off drugs or child or adolescent rebounds within two to four weeks. And we continued to follow this child monthly with serial viral load testing and at 27 months on routine follow-up at 46 months of age was identified as having rebound viremia. So what does this case do? It actually illustrates what we're aiming for when we, as you saw from Carl's slide, on the left is eradication and cure, and on the right side of the, the road, it's art-free remission. 
And in our mind, this pediatric case is the best illustration of how to define HIV remission, um, as shown on this slide, where you have a confirmed infection with high levels of replicating virus, suppressed on antiretroviral treatment, shown in blue. You go off antiretroviral treatment, and there's no detectable circulating virus in um, RNA in the circulation within if it's a remission, there would be some period of viremic relapse, as illustrated in this case. Um, so the HIV cure and remission strategies from a pediatric standpoint is shown on this slide. And what you see here is that the main focus currently, this is not um, exclusively, because we hope to expand this agenda going forward, is really focused on very early antiretroviral treatment. This is the lowest hanging fruit for a perinatal HIV remission and cure agenda. As I said, we know when infants are exposed to HIV through maternal infection, and so we can intervene very early to disrupt uh, stable reservoirs from forming. And what you see on this slide is since the report of the Mississippi baby, there actually have been several cases of early treated infants who subsequently were identified as having art free remission, and I'll go through those cases in detail. In addition, there's a, a San Francisco adult who was treated very early in the context of PrEP, who underwent, um, actually I think about three years of treatment, finally went off treatment and experienced eight months of remission. So I think together these cases are showing if you can intervene very early, not a practical approach for adults, but certainly in the context of prevention studies, if you can identify an adult also early enough, starting treatment early could perturb the stability of the reservoir. And so what this slide shows you is really all of the clinical trials, and this is a beautiful table. This is taken from data um, that Richard uh, Jeffries has generated um, as part of Treatment Action Group. Um, and this was at late 2018, summarizing the various clinical trials that are underway in adults and children. And what you see in yellow and, and in, in the far blue box on the left are all the various strategies, as Carl outlined, um, in terms of trying to purge and eliminate HIV reservoirs. And so in adults, there are multiple trials that are underway to look at proof of concept trials, how to eliminate these reservoirs. But what's shaded in blue is really the two main arms of the HIV remission and cure agenda for pediatrics. It's important to point out that perinatal HIV infection spans the age spectrum. So a kid who is a newborn eventually becomes an older child and eventually becomes an adolescent and an adult. And so when we think about developing a pediatric remission and cure agenda, we have to think about specifically what's appropriate for a given age group. And so right now, our portfolio is actually very limited and just currently focused on newborns and older infants. So I'm gonna go through these trials, and the first clinical trial is um, known as IMPACT P1115. This is being conducted in the context of the International Maternal Pediatric AIDS um, Adolescent Clinical Trials Group. And this is a very early treatment trial. And there are four steps involved. We are only at step two for version one. And essentially, high-risk infants are identified and started prospectively on the three-drug regimen, AZT, 3TC, and nevirapine. The only time you can actually use lopinavir in this setting is the infants have to be 42 weeks gestational age or around two weeks of age. And so lupinavir, ritonavir is added at two weeks, around two weeks of age, and then continued for up to 30 weeks in those with continued virologic suppression before they go to a three-drug regimen. So infants are started prospectively. Once they're identified as infected, then they move to step two and stay on the combination regimen. If they're not infected, then they um, go off treatment and go off the standard uh, treatment, um, standard of care. So the primary objective is to assess remission among in utero infected infants who initiate very early treatment. And or HIV remission in this case, our case definition would be those going off treatment who have no confirmed plasma viral rebound within 48 weeks of stopping antiretroviral treatment. 
And I'm gonna go very quickly because I'm seeing the time is 10 minutes. And so I'm pleased to say that in version one of Impact P1115, so what's unique about the pediatric program, it's um, involves 13 countries around the world, Africa, Latin America, um, Thailand, and within the US. We en enrolled 440 mother infant pairs into this study over a two-year period and have identified 34 infected infants who've received these very early treatment regimen. And there's a, a poster being presented at this meeting um, describing the virologic response to very early treatment. As I said, no infants have reached step three to go off antiretroviral treatment yet, but we hope to be able to report on those. There is um, a version two now that is at clinical trial sites that will include more potent regimens. So in the meantime, now we've established PKs for raltegravir and also for VRCO1. So version two will include infants who receive either raltegravir-based ART with nevirapine or in addition to VRCO1, a broadly neutralizing antibodies. And so these are the, the nine clinical trials that are underway in perinatal infections, heavily based towards very early treatment and early treatment. There's one trial of combination broadly neutralizing antibodies that's underway or in development in Botswana for early treated infants, and a hurricane study which will look at therapeutic vaccines in older perinatal children and adolescents. The second uh, clinical trial that's in uh, development is IMPACT-2008 that will combine VRCO1 with, ART, with or without ART. And this trial has enrolled 15 of the 64 infants uh, so far. Here is really to see if we can promote a decrease in reservoir size. So what's our hope here? Our hope here is that very early therapy and early treatment will lead to conditions that are favorable for art-free remission in pediatric populations to improve health outcomes for this group. As I said, the case of the Mississippi baby provided us with a case definition as to what we're looking for in these clinical trials. Since the report of the Mississippi baby in 2013, there's been a case of a French teenager. Um, in 2016, likewise, a, a child who was treated early, treated through seven years of age and has been off therapy now for over 12 years in remission. In 2019, there was a third um, case report of a South African child treated around uh, eight or nine weeks of age for 40 weeks and has been in remission for 8.5 years. So three cases of art-free remission in perinatal infection. In Australia, there was a 25-year-old woman who's perinatally infected who has, was treated for uh, through 23 years of age and is now has been in remission for about three years. So what are our future goals here is really to fill the gap for clinical trials for art-free remission and cure really by age. We hope to now expand to older children, adolescents, and pre-adolescents using broadly neutralizing antibodies and therapeutic vaccines. There was a question early in the session why, um, you know, given the balance, you can take a single pill and you can live a long time as an adult. As you know, an HIV-infected adult starting therapy in 2008 to 2017 can live 70 years plus. But these are data from the U.S. cohort. The mean age of death for a perinatally infected child in the U.S. is about 23 years of age. And the mortality ratio is about 32-fold higher than their uninfected peers. So there is a clear rationale here for having uh, therapeutic strategies towards AIDS remission, HIV remission and cure for this population. And I'll stop there and thank you for inviting me to discuss the pediatric remission and cure agenda. And I really need to acknowledge the people who do the work here is we'll have a cure scientific committee of individuals who are involved in, in generating these ideas, implementing these uh, clinical trials and the funding. Thank you. We have questions. Oh. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have two quick questions. One is about the P115 study, which Uganda is taking part of. Um, I wonder how, when you take these children off treatment, is this interruption analytical? How often do you check their viral load to see whether the virus has rebounded. Is it one month, two weeks, or three months? 
Secondly, there is little talk about the South African baby these days. There's a lot of silence about this child, and we wonder what is happening. I have a question about these two babies, the South African child and the Mississippi baby. The South African child has been in remission for close to 10 years, and the Mississippi baby was off treatment for, you said, like close to two years, something like that. My question is, the difference in the time, do you think was because of the regiment that was given to the baby, the difference in regiment to the two babies? And secondly, did the South African child get a monoclonal antibody? And if he did, don't you think the virus rebounded in the Mississippi baby because of the absence of a monoclonal antibody? Thank you, Moses. Um, so your first question with P1115 and going off treatment, and is it analytical, and how often um, to sample? So first, I will say no infant has gone off treatment in P1115 just yet. We have um, clear biomarkers. We established an expert panel because, as you know, it's very controversial in terms of stopping antiretroviral treatment in any HIV-infected persons. The first thing I want to say is kids go off their treatment all the time. Um, you know, their adherence is a big problem. Within this trial, we have a clear biomarker, and that is we know that the prerequisite to control is likely going to be having a small reservoir. That's going to be the first prerequisite. And so for, to be able to go off or to qualify for step three and go off antiretroviral treatment, the child has to be HIV antibody negative, and two, has to have no detectable HIV DNA in the circulation using our most sensitive assays. So once a child reaches um, those two criteria, then there's gonna be discussion with the family and the care providers whether the child should go off treatment. Once, if there is agreement that the, the child, because that child will now be about two and a half to three years of age, goes off treatment, we actually have implemented on-demand testing. So it's, week, it's a, a, a different algorithm. So in the first four weeks, it's weekly testing with an on-demand, with a turnaround time of 65 minutes. So the child stays in the clinic. For those who don't have the equipment on site, there's a 24-hour turnaround time. So we will have an on-demand test with rapid turnaround to be able to capture a virus rebound. And so it's weekly in the first month and then every two weeks after that, and then it goes to monthly after about three months. So there's gonna be rigorous surveillance in the first few weeks of antiretroviral treatment because we know most will rebound two to four weeks. Um, your second had to do with the South African child versus the Mississippi baby. I think each of these cases highlights how unique the virus outcome is in each individual. The Mississippi baby had no detectable antibody during the period of remission. Now with rebound, she has detectable antibody, and she had no HIV-specific immune responses. The South African child, they've identified some what are called natural killer cell activity, some um, antibodies present to various, detectable to various regions of the virus, but not at substantial level. So it's probably a combination of things, the virus you're infected with, the host immune response, to the virus that leads to this unique state of remission. So you're right, the South African child is almost nine or 10 years off antiretroviral treatment. The, that child was one of, I think, 227 infants enrolled in the trial, so it shows it's still less than 1% likelihood. But um, I think from each of these cases, we can learn clues on how to proceed with our own art, uh, free remission trials. Thank you for the question. Thank you for your presentation and for bringing these cases to us. Two questions, one with regard to the, case, the cases that are in remission from a variety of countries. Is there a similarity in the regimens or the timing of when the regimen started for those individuals? And then a, a second question with regard to the mortality for um, the rates. Are those all HIV-related deaths that we're seeing, or is there a separation in the data between what happens in terms of behavior 
or lifestyle or care? Yeah. So, so the first, your first question, oh, the regimens. So it's easy in pediatrics, and it, it's actually dismal because we don't have many regimens for that age group. So just to give you a perspective, the only regimen we have for the first few years of life currently or in the time these cases were described was AZT3GC and Kalitra, Lopinavir, Ritonavir. The Mississippi baby received AZT3GC and Navarapine and was switched to Lopinavir, Ritonavir much later on. Um, so the regimens are fairly similar, the timing of treatment. The Mississippi baby was treated within 48 hours of life, specifically 30 hours, received three, a three-drug regimen, really for prevention, not intended to treat because didn't usually treat at that young an age. The other cases were treated around two to three months of age, which is standard um, early treatment. So to summarize, the regimens were not that different um, amongst the, the three cases that I report. And your second has to do with the what's causing mortality in the perinatally infected youth in the United States. They're largely HIV-related um, issues. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so in the morning session, we had a talk on ethics of cell and gene therapy, and I noticed that on the chart um, for clinical trials available for pediatrics, um, the gene therapy strategy was still a yellow. Do you have like a opinion on the ethics of involving pediatrics and adolescents in cell and gene therapy? So one um, close protocol we have for gene therapy is actually uh, within the IMPACT network. It's uh, IMPACT P1107. It's a cord blood transplantation protocol with CCR5 Delta 32 transplants. It's actually from 18 months to 80 years of age. Anyone qualifies for that study. Or two study participants have been adults. Um, one has succumbed at uh, one year, and the second, um, we have a second, a woman who is transplanted and is 18 months out now and, and fully suppressed. With respect to your question in terms of CCR5 disruption, I think if these um, therapies are efficacious, it warrants study in adolescents. We have a growing, we have a substantial number of HIV-infected adolescents, perinatally infected adolescents with multi-drug resistant virus in whom there are no treatment options, so for whom these strategies could potentially be beneficial. Obviously, the flip side is some of those kids may be more immunosuppressed, so not the right candidates. But I think there are ways we can approach this safely, um, especially in those who are CCR5 heterozygous, right? Because maybe you just need to knock out one part of the gene in those individuals. So the last slide in terms of building our portfolio really has to do with these proof of concept studies that builds upon the adult, you know, that there's not this clear separation of pediatric and adults because a child does become an adult and they're the future of our, you know, the future of the world. So I think we really want to think about this disease as across the age spectrum from neonates to adulthood. And so any strategies that work in adults, we would like to be able to study in a cautious and systematic way in our population. Thank you for the question. Well, thank you for your presentation. I also like to, to see more about pediatric um, cure research. Uh, it's something that we are, I'm, I'm from the European AIDS treatment group, so it's something that we would like also to see addressed more promptly from uh, in Europe. Um, and when I was looking at the trial sites, I was a bit um, uh, disappointed that the Europe didn't make it in a way, especially when I was looking at the big region of uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, where the, it's the only region where the epidemic is actually growing, and we have 1.6 million people living with HIV, and there is high prevalence of women uh, living with HIV there. So I was wondering how we can try, as a community, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm reflecting from, from the community perspective, how we can try to, to reduce this uh, unmet uh, opportunity from, from, from that. Yeah, region. thanks for that question. So we're actually part of the EPICAL consortium. It's a VIV-sponsored uh, 
consortium that's uh, aimed specifically at HIV remission and cure in, in European uh, populations, and including African and, and Thai populations. And so the hurricane trial will recruit perinatally infected uh, children and adolescents in, from Europe, Thailand, and, and South Africa. So we're working with the European group um, to build that program and portfolio. So again, that it's synergistic across borders and not segregated, say, the US or, or Africa. Our goal really is across the AIDS spectrum, across the globe. So through interactions with these consortium, I think we hope to be able to expand the knowledge that we learned from these trials to, to other groups. So there's ongoing conversations and collaborations. Thank you.